Dr. Shanti Woods is joining us this morning with some more information. And I was just telling you that even though when my daughter 14 years ago was born, it was all on the back, on the back, but she slept better on her stomach and it was so hard. You make a very interesting observation. I think that we as pediatricians need to let parents know, guess mm -hmm. what, babies will sleep better on their stomachs. Babies will sleep better, meaning longer in the bed with the parents, but that is the wrong right. thing to do. We are increasing the risk for sudden infant death syndrome. This is where parents wake up in the morning, baby doesn't wake up. Well, listen, parents are freaked out enough when they bring their newborn home. And so then it's all about how to get your baby to sleep properly. So go through some of the recommendations once again with us. Sure, take home message is gonna be A, B, C, and D. We've added on a D. A means alone, B means on the back, C means in the crib or bassinet, right. and D means do not smoke, do not drink. Okay, any other recommendations? Yes, uh, parents should be allow their child to be in the room. So right. bed, uh, room sharing is okay, sure. bed sharing not okay. Okay, so you can have the bassinet near the bed. That is correct. So proximate sleep okay, but baby in the bed, horrible idea. What do you recommend for when it's the right time to move the baby into their own room? Because um, as parents, we sort of have that fireman's response. You hear a cry, you automatically wake up, but you could right. be waking each other up. Right. So. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. However, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends one year, mm -hmm. so 12 months in the room. That's a bit long, so six months is when we start to encourage. If you think your child is mature enough and they're getting a good quality sleep, six, seven, eight hours, that might be a great time to transition them to their room. Okay, so just like in real life when your babies grow from being infants to all of a sudden they're teenagers, we go from cribs, worrying about cribs, to worrying about cell phone addiction. Okay, it's gonna happen Yikes. fast, people, I'm telling you, Very it really fast. does. It, it's so addictive. So what do you talk, when you give parents recommendations for when kids should be on their iPhones what are your recommendations so we used to say no more than two hours of screen time mm -hmm. now screen includes the TV tablet or phone we say we used to say no more than two hours right now it's four hours however same thing no one size fits all right parents get involved if there's one message I can make to families it is to get involved be nosy it is okay to be nosy and the new word right now is irky it is okay to be an irky parent to say what are you looking at what websites are you on are you bullying are your friends bullying get involved. And do you believe that, that iPhones or iPads or whatever, or, or cell phones in general are addictive? Cell phones are addictive. I want to let parents know that <laughs> they have developers whose job is to make this device addictive, make you click. If you mm -hmm. search one thing, the next app that you're in is giving you a suggestion, go to this website for that item you looked at two websites ago, so they're designed to be addictive. And we always talk about this too, because you can't tell your kid to get off their phone if you're always on your phone too. So parents, you have to be a model, put your cell phones down. There should be media-free zones mm -hmm. in your house and media-free times in your house. I think we're all so guilty of that. Thank you, Dr. Woods, really appreciate it. Thank you, Jennifer. You're